Well, Paul, as you remember from last week, has put himself in the position to be sent to Rome. He could have been released. There were no legitimate charges ever brought against him in these trials that he had been through, but he made the appeal that he wanted to be tried before Caesar because Paul's ultimate objective was to get the gospel to Rome. These last two chapters, we're in chapter 27 and 28 this morning, these last two chapters are Luke's uh, detailed description of Paul's journey to Rome. Paul is shown to be a very courageous leader uh, in these two chapters. He's one who knows how to take charge when difficulty arises, and he as a leader is one who knows how to serve. He's willing to serve and to look out for others. Chapter tw- 27, verse 1, you see uh, Luke, who of course is the author of the book of Acts, uses the word we. Again, Luke has rejoined Paul. He's kind of been in and out um, through Acts, through the journeys with Paul. He's rejoined Paul, uh, probably going along on this journey to Rome while Paul is uh, under guard, imprisoned, if you will, as his physician. He also mentions in verse 2 a a believer by the name of Aristarchus, who was probably Paul's uh, assistant or attendant. Um, It was not uncommon because Paul was a Roman citizen. He had special privileges others would not have had, so it was not uncommon for him to be able to have someone travel with him. You know, Paul, if you look at his life, not only the book of Acts, but in his epistles, there, there were some times that Paul was alone, but as much as was possible, Paul always had others with him or others around him. And that's just a reminder to me this week that we're not designed as believers, we're not meant um, to go it alone. Uh, We all need help and we all need encouragement. And I would say to you this morning, especially if you know someone who is in a leadership role, not just the pastor, but other pastors on our staff, uh, deacons, uh, Bible study leaders, if you know someone in a leadership role, you you need to keep in mind they have significant uh, mental and emotional and spiritual burdens on them as shepherds. And they need an extra dose, if you will, of, of an encouragement and, uh, and, and help. Well, verse 1 says that uh, Paul is on this uh, ship. It says that there were other prisoners. Now, the word other doesn't just mean in addition to Paul. There were others beside Paul. It, it literally means, the word other means, uh, of another kind. So it's very likely that many of these other prisoners that were with Paul Um, had not committed the kinds of crimes that Paul had committed, but probably much more serious crimes. They were headed to Rome either for trial or perhaps they'd already been tried and for some reason were being sent to Rome for execution. But, you know, even if some of these others um, had committed serious enough crimes that they were probably going to be executed or put to death, if you think about it, being imprisoned with Paul was the best thing that ever happened to them in their life. Why? What was Paul going to do? going to share the gospel. These guys were going to hear from Paul, and while their earthly life may end, they were going to have opportunity to enjoy eternal life because of the message that Paul was going to give them. And let me pause here and mention something that's, that's fairly new in our state that you may not have heard about yet. And this is related to, I try to encourage you every week regarding your giving when we come to our time of offering at the end of the service. Because of your giving, Uh, what we give goes cooperatively through our state convention and to our Southern Baptist Convention. There's a lot of ministries that we could not do by ourselves. Because of your giving, uh, we're about to launch, as Arkansas Baptists, we're about to launch a seminary education program in our state prison system. Through a cooperation with Arkansas Baptists and uh, Mid-America Seminary, men who are in prison, many of whom who will never be released, so therefore life sentences, are going to have the opportunity to get a seminary education. Now, let me, let me say this about prisoners, those with Paul and those today. Not everyone in prison is just evil to the core. Some of them have just made horrible mistakes, and they're paying for those mistakes. These men in prison in the state of Arkansas are going to have the opportunity to get a seminary education, and even if they're not ever going to be released, even if they're in for life, many of them will pursue a seminary education so they can be chaplains and be pastors within the prison system. Isn't that phenomenal? It's phenomenal that we'd be able to offer that opportunity. It's because of the faithfulness of the giving uh, of our church and other churches in the state of Arkansas. Verse 3 says they got to Sidon. Paul was allowed to, uh, to visit friends and to get supplies. And you might think, well, that, that's kind of odd that he's a prisoner of the Roman government. Well, Paul was highly esteemed and highly trusted. Why? Because Paul lived a life of integrity. 
When we live lives of integrity, God opens doors that would not be open uh, any other way. All right, read with me. Let's jump in in chapter 27 at verse 9, verses 9 through 13, chapter 27 of the book of Acts. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to the shore. Well... They had sailed along the coast, and they had come to this, this harbor called Fair Havens. You notice Paul mentioned it's a dangerous time of year to sail because it was after the fast. The fast is referring to Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, the most high and holy day in, in Israel, and that usually occurred around September, October. Now, sailing in these waters was difficult between September, mid-September, mid-November, but nearly impossible from mid-November to mid-February. So they're probably somewhere around uh, late October, maybe even November, and they want to set sail. You notice in verse 10, Paul says, I perceive. Well, how did Paul perceive? Well, two things. Number one, we know from 2 Corinthians that Paul had already suffered through three shipwrecks prior to this one. So he had some experience about sailing and shipwrecks, but also we know that's very likely that the Spirit revealed that to him. Now, let me pause here and say just very quickly, it's always a good idea to learn from the shipwrecks of others, right? Not to repeat those things. And and let let me go a step further and say to students who are in this room and students who are in the venue, the smartest thing you can do is learn from your parents' shipwrecks, Okay, they've had them, and it's smart to learn from them. Paul had experienced some shipwrecks, and he says, look, I perceive we're going to lose a ship, we're going to lose cargo, we're going to lose lives, but you see the centurion doesn't listen to Paul. He makes the decision to go on, and I want you to see three things that led him to this decision because these are great examples of what not to look at when you're trying to determine the will of God for your life. Here's how not to determine God's will. The first thing, it says that he wanted to get to Phoenix because Fair Havens, where they were, was not the best place or not the most comfortable place to spend the winter. So part of his decision was based on their comfort. They were going to have to winter somewhere for two or three months. It was based on their comfort. And I would say to you this morning, God, if you're walking with him and you're truly following him, he's not always going to have you in a comfortable place. Sometimes he's going to put you in a difficult place. He may put you in a difficult place because there's a work that he wants to do there, and you're going to be part of that work. He may put you in a difficult place because the work that he wants to do is in you. I remember several years ago reading a short article written by a man who had discovered the uh, cocoon of an emperor moth in his yard. And he was kind of intrigued by it. It had, it had fallen, and so he picked it up, and he had taken it in his house, and he watched it for several days. And one day he noticed a little hole, a little opening in the end, and he could see that that, that moth was struggling to get out. And he watched it, and he came back, and he looked at it again and kept watching. For several hours, it appeared no progress was being made. And so out of his sympathy and compassion for that poor moth that could get out, he he took a knife and very carefully slid open the cocoon. And when he did that, out of the cocoon rolled a fat body with little bitty shriveled up wings. What he didn't know is the way that God designed it was that emperor moth was supposed to struggle supposed to be in difficulty, supposed to be in stress, because in forcing itself out of that little opening at the end of the cocoon, it forced the fluids from the body of the moth into the wings that became so beautiful when they were expanded. Sometimes God puts us in difficulty because there's a work that he needs to do in us so that we can be all that he has called us to be. You need to be very careful about making a move or about making a change because there's this comfort in your life. The second thing you see, Julius, this, uh, this Roman centurion, listened to the expert advice of the pilot and the ship's owner over Paul. If you're not trying to determine the will of God, you better be very careful whom you listen to and whom you seek advice from. Now, to be fair, 
Julius doesn't know God. He doesn't have reason to listen to the advice from this man of God. But for our purposes, let's say that the pilot represents the wisdom of the world and Paul represents the wisdom of God. Never, ever value the expert wisdom of the world over the wisdom of God. You will lose every time. Paul was outvoted. It says that the majority decided that we would, we would sail on. Listen, the majority is not always right. And I'll assure you, no matter what the majority says, God is always greater than the majority. If God has told you to do something, you better follow God's way and forget about what the majority says. Third thing we see here, it says in verse 13, they were concerned about the weather, but in verse 13 it says the weather changed. A south wind blew gently. That's exactly what they were looking for. And they assumed because that south wind began to blow um, that that they were safe to, to go on. You know, you need to be careful in trusting what you see. Circumstances can be very, very deceiving. I imagine that as they sailed out of that harbor at Fair Havens, the centurion and probably the pilot and the ship's owner looked kind of smugly at Paul like, yeah, you see? They were probably pretty arrogant about the fact that they were right, but that arrogance turned to angst in just a few hours. Is that wind, that northeaster, blew in And in in verse 14, it says this, it was a tempestuous wind. From tempestuous wind in the Greek, we get the word typhoon. Or another way to say it is it was a wind with a violent anger. And that ship at this point is absolutely beyond their control. It's it's blown and it's tossed. It it reminded me of what James said in chapter 1. If you don't have wisdom from God, you're going to be blown and tossed in life. Well, they hadn't followed the wisdom of God through Paul, and they were blown and they were tossed, and they began desperate things. First thing they did is they, they, brought, they had a lifeboat. They brought that lifeboat in. It wasn't big enough for everyone on the ship, but it was a lifeboat, but it was wooden. It wasn't a rubber raft like we have today, and it kept banging into the ship, so they brought it up on the deck and lashed it down, and then somehow they took ropes, and they tied ropes around the hull of the boat, hoping that would keep the boat from breaking up, and they got so desperate, they threw the rigging and the tackle overboard, what they used to raise and lower the sails, and what they used to bring cargo on and and, and load off the ship. They threw all that stuff overboard. Look in chapter 27, verses 21 to 26. Since they'd been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them, this is in the middle of the storm, and said, men, you should have listened to me and not set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Their their lives are not going to be lost either. Verse 25, so take heart, men, for I have faith in God, and it will be exactly as I have said, but we must run aground on some island. So here you have Paul the captive that becomes Paul the captain. You see, in true crisis, leaders always rise. And Paul becomes the captain, or Paul becomes the leader. He he gives encouragement. Uh, He gives instructions. Hey, we're going to run aground. You need to eat. Um, He warns uh, the Roman guards. The crew decides, some of them decide when all this is going on, that they'll just take the lifeboat and get off the ship. And he tells the Roman guards, you can't let them escape. We've all got to stay together if we're going to make it. So Paul gives instructions. He gives encouragement. And then Paul's an example. He affirms to them his faith in God. He says, I'm completely sure because the God whom I serve has promised me that we're all going to be saved. We're going to lose the ship. We're going to lose the cargo. But not one life is going to be lost. And then later in that chapter, you see that Paul breaks bread and gives thanks. I'm sure that was an odd thing to them in the midst of the storm. Paul's just calmly breaking bread, encouraging to eat, giving thanks. Look down in verse 42 to 44. The soldier's plan as the ship ran aground and began to break up, the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners. Why? They're Romans. They're responsible. The soldier's responsible for the prisoner. If the prisoner escapes, the soldier pays for it with his life. Their plan was to kill the prisoners lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion wishing to save Paul. Again, Paul is highly esteemed. Wishing to save Paul, he kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered that those who could swim to jump overboard first, make sure to make for the land, and the rest 
on planks and on pieces of ship, and so it was that all were brought safely to land. Paul, Paul saves the prisoners. His presence saves them from certain death at the hands of these soldiers. Well, they make it through the storm. You know, we know in life that storms are going to come. Sometimes those storms are due to our own disobedience. Think Jonah. Sometimes those storms, like in this case, are due to the disobedience of others. But we're going to face storms. I love uh, Bruce Chester, uh, a couple of pastors back, used to always say, you've either just come out of a storm or maybe without knowing it, you're headed into the storm. We're going to go through storms in life. And what storms do is they reveal our character and they provide opportunity. Think about the character of Paul compared to the character of those sailors that want to abandon ship. Paul's going to stay. Paul's going to make sure that everyone is taken care of. Paul, because of the storm, has opportunity to serve and to witness to those who are around him. You're going to face storms. I'm going to face storms. We have to decide before we're in the midst of the storm that we're going to let God use that storm in our life to build our character and to provide opportunity. Well, chapter 28 they make it, they, they're shipwrecked, they make it to the island of Malta, which interestingly, Malta means refuge. God had prepared a refuge for them. It says that the natives welcomed them. There were 276 people on board this ship. And the natives on this small island of Malta welcomed them, they took care of them, they provided for their needs. <coughs> Excuse me, Paul, you notice, as they make it to shore and they're, they're building a fire, Paul's not sitting back. And he could have been. Paul could have been saying, well, I rescued everyone. I have a right to sit back and let them wait on me and let them care for me. But no, Paul is a servant leader. He's right in the middle of the activity. Um, They're gathering things to build a fire. Paul, gathering some brush, is bitten by a viper. And uh, the natives, of course, think, well, he's just been judged. He's escaped. Uh, jail so far. He's being carried by the Romans. Uh, He may be in prison for life. He may be put to death, but whether that happens or not, uh, the gods have taken care of him. But Paul just shakes the viper off and goes on about his business. Now, it's interesting, Paul didn't seem to be uh, too shook up by that, too taken back by that. But the reason is that Paul knew he was on a mission from God. God had a plan for Paul. Nothing, not a storm, not a shipwreck, not a viper was going to thwart God's plan. Listen, God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. And none of you, when you're in a storm, if you're walking with the Lord, none of you need to worry about the outcome. You just need to trust. If God has a plan, nothing will thwart his plan. Not a hair on your head will be hurt if that's not part of God's plan and purpose for you. Look in verse 11. They wintered on that island. It says they spent three months on the island. Got a question for you. You think Paul evangelized while he was there? Man, he must have loved that three months with those people on the island. You remember last week we saw that Paul in Romans 1 said, I am obligated to share the gospel. And we are as well, every opportunity we have. Verses 12 through 16 describes the route they took getting to Rome. Paul gets to Rome, verses 17 through 24, his first concern is is with the Jews, just like everywhere he went. Although Paul is taking the gospel to the Gentiles, he's not overlooking the Jews. He was worried, perhaps word had gotten to Rome ahead of him. He was worried that things had been said about him or about the gospel, and perhaps the Jews wouldn't listen to him. But when he met with them the first time, they said, we don't know anything about your case. We haven't heard anything evil uh, about you. And so they agreed to hear him. On the appointed day, Paul, from morning until evening, explained the scriptures and told them the truth about Jesus. And you see there in the scripture it says, some were convinced, others were not. Paul had delivered the message to the Jews, now he's going to turn to the Gentiles. Paul always went to the Jews first, and Paul, Luke doesn't record that he said it here, but Paul could have said here the same thing, He said to the Ephesian leaders in Acts 20, I'm innocent of the blood of all men because I have delivered, I have given to you the full counsel, the whole counsel of God. Now look at his final words to the Jews who were still disagreeing, still disbelieving in chapter 28, verses 26 through 28. 
Paul is quoting the prophet Isaiah. Look at this. Go to this people and say, you will indeed hear but never understand. You will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull and with their ears they can barely hear and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their ears and see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Therefore, he says, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. You know, those words from the Old Testament describe the tragic condition, not only then, but also now, of people who won't accept and respond to the truth. Look what he says. Their heart is dull. They can barely hear, and they close their eyes. The Jews had the Scriptures of all people on the face of the earth at this time, they should have known and understood the truth more clearly than anyone. You know, it seems like the more spiritual privilege people have, the more resistant they are to spiritual truth. You think about that in the context of our nation. The U.S. is, without a doubt, at this time, the most spiritually privileged nation in the world. But people aren't very responsive to the gospel. There are people who are in church every week, this church and other churches that have heard the truth and heard the truth and heard the truth, but they don't understand and they don't perceive. Their heart has grown dull and calloused and they don't respond to the gospel. The closing of chapter 28, the closing of the book of Acts, it says in verse 30 and 31 that Paul lived in his own house. Paul was free, although he was uh, Under the Romans, technically he was in prison. It was kind of a house arrest. He lived in his own house, and he was free to proclaim the gospel to tell people about Jesus. And because Paul was imprisoned by the Romans, he was in this house. He was chained to a guard. Every six hours, those guards changed shift. What do you think those guards heard continually from the mouth of Paul? Oh, no, not Paul, not again. But you know what Paul says in Philippians 1 and 4? Paul says that some of those guards came to know Christ. Well, with that, Luke, Luke ends his record. There's no word on the trial um, from historical records and from Paul's own writings that, that detail some of his visits to uh, other churches that he made. It appears that this time Paul was released Uh, from Rome, only just a few years later to be rearrested, tried, and of course executed, somewhere around 67 or 68 AD. Now, uh, Luke's ending uh, of this account is kind of abrupt, and, and we don't really know why, but I like what I read by one commentator who simply said, there is no formal proper ending to the book of Acts because the story goes on. The story goes on because we, you and I, have been given the task of carrying the gospel, disseminating the gospel to all the nations. Now, before we finish our study of Acts this morning, I thought it'd be good to remember our purpose objective when we began back in January. We said that we wanted to see how God worked, how God moved through the early church, and from that, draw, from that historical negative, draw some uh, historical narrative, draw some perspectives or principles of how God would use us in the church today. Now, I can't possibly review 27 weeks in the next few minutes, but I want to remind you of just a few threads that you can see running throughout the book. In fact, what I did is I sat down and I thought, okay, if I was going to give this book a different title, what would I title it? I came up with four different titles. The first title that I would give the book of Acts, would I'd simply call it the witness of the apostles. Because what you see throughout the book of Acts is them obeying the command to take the gospel to all nations. And they did a far better job than we're doing today. And think about the fact they did it without the transportation we have today and the communication we have today. They were simply faithful to the task, and and God bless that. You know, the Greek word for witness is the word martius. That probably sounds pretty close to you to the word martyr. It's where we get the word martyr. So literally, as witnesses, they were putting their life on the line for the gospel. There was one overarching purpose of life, and they gave their lives to it, and and we're called to give our lives to that same purpose. The second title I would give the book of Acts is The Importance of the Church. 
throughout the book of Acts, as the church began and, and as the church spread and there were more and more churches, you see that throughout the book they were gathered consistently. Consistently, the body gathered together daily. Weekly, they all came together in, in a larger setting like this, but daily they gathered in homes. But consistently, they met together. And you remember from Acts chapter 2, we're told that they were steadfastly devoted to four things. The scriptures, apostles' teaching, fellowship, that's unity and, and accountability, the breaking of bread, remembering the sacrifice of Christ, and prayer. They were devoted to those things. I was thinking this week about being devoted to the scriptures. I remember that last week I mentioned to you <clears throat> that uh, we need to be very careful that we know the scripture well. And you remember last week we talked about the resurrection and how important the resurrection was. And I said that there'll be some in our day that deny that. And you really don't have hope without the resurrection. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. If he did that as a good man, that's great, but it does nothing for us. It's the resurrection that's the good news of the gospel. I mentioned it to you last week. On Monday, I got a text from my daughter in Texas. She said, Dad, you won't believe. A pastor in our town got in his pulpit this week and said he didn't think it was necessary to believe in the resurrection. And then she said this, what does he have to preach about? Doesn't that work him out of a job? Absolutely. If the job of a pastor is to proclaim the good news, you can't do that apart from the resurrection. In fact, I tell you that last Sunday also, right here in Little Rock, a pastor got up and proclaimed to his congregation that deviant sexual behavior was not a sin. In fact, he even said the word abomination does not mean abomination. You better know the Scripture. You better dig in and you better know the Scripture. Third title I'd give to the book, I'd call it The Acts of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he was directing everything. The Holy Spirit was providing power. The Holy Spirit was the one who was giving them strength and persecution. The Holy Spirit is the one who has given them courage and boldness in their witness. The Holy Spirit. And then fourthly, I would title the book, The Priority of Prayer. Because prayer is essential for the work. Without prayer, we are powerless and directionless. And I guess if, if you are a note taker, I've just given you the four application points this morning. Luke ends the book of Acts. It doesn't have any good closure because the book of Acts goes on. We're called to be witnesses, to carry on the work that began in the book of Acts of getting the gospel to all nations. The church is important. Not dropping in once a month or even a couple times a month. We need to be together regularly, devoting ourselves to, to the word, to fellowship, unity, and accountability to remembering what Christ has done for us, to prayer. We need to be not just as a body of Christ, but individually, for the body of Christ to be under control of the Holy Spirit, individually we need to be under control of the Holy Spirit, that we're walking with him and, and obeying him day by day. And then we need to be a people of prayer. Let me mention to you regarding prayer, when I became the pastor of Geyer Springs a little over three years ago, I told you that that would be a priority for our body. And I've got to confess to you that I have not kept that as high a priority as it needed to be. When I became the pastor, I, I jotted my first day in the office, I jotted down several things that I felt God clearly calling me to. I think there's about 10 or 11 things on the list. Four are related to prayer, both personal and corporate. And this last uh, Monday night, uh, 10 of our pastors, we went together to a, uh, a prayer gathering hosted by the state convention. It was very convicting. And I came away from that reminding myself that I cannot expect you to be a people of prayer if I'm not a man of prayer. So I want you to know I've made a renewed commitment that this church is going to be a people of prayer, and I understand that that begins with me. So you can count on that happening. Not because of me, but because that's what God wants. That's what the Spirit has called us to. Our, our ministries all the wonderful things we do, the things we do in-house, Barnabas Project, all those things are great, but they're useless apart from prayer because prayer is where the power is. Prayer is what connects us with the Spirit of God. Prayer is what gives us the direction that we need. That's what God has called us to as a body. We're to be his witnesses. We're to be the church like the church was in Acts whose main responsibility was getting the gospel 
out. We're to be devoted to Scripture, to prayer. That's what he's called us to, not just corporately. It's got to happen individually if it's going to happen corporately.